This is Andy Alspa from Duke University School of Medicine. This presentation will focus on fungal infections that are encountered routinely by clinicians during their interactions with patients. Among the fungi that cause disease in humans, candida species are common commensal microorganisms on skin and mucosal surfaces. They grow predominantly in culture in a round, yeast-like form, but they can transition to other morphologies. Therefore, as learning objectives for this section, we will discuss the close association between the anatomic sites of candida colonization and the subsequent development of candida disease. We will also look at the different shapes that these fungi can assume and how this determines the predominant structure in which candida species exist on surfaces, the fungal biofilm. Finally, we will move from basic biology and begin to explore clinical manifestations of candidiasis as these commensal organisms transition to become pathogens, causing human disease. The varied group of diseases known as candidiasis can be caused by many different fungal species, and some of the names of clinically important candida species are noted on the slide. For example, candida albicans is the most frequent human colonizer in normal patients, and therefore the most common cause of human infections. Other candida species that less frequently cause disease include candida glabrata, candida, candida cruzii, candida tropicalis, candida dubliniensis, candida parapsilosis, and candida lusitaniae. Each of these species can be readily identified in the clinical microbiology lab based on different morphological and biochemical features. Candida albicans is the candida species most commonly causing human candidiasis. It is a normal inhabitant of human mucosal surfaces, and up to 25% of people can be colonized with this fungus at any point in time. Candida albicans can be readily and quickly identified in the clinical microbiology laboratory by its ability to form germ tubes or filamentous projections arising from the rounder yeast-like cells, as demonstrated in the cartoon image on this slide. This transition occurs very quickly under appropriate inducing conditions, potentially allowing a trained microbiology technologist to rapidly assign a candida species designation to an individual isolate. Recent studies have demonstrated the importance of biofilms in candida pathogenesis. Now, biofilms are complex communities of microorganisms that exist on various surfaces. As exposed to merely living as isolated yeast cells on mucosa, candida albicans and other candida species grow as a complex mixture of yeast and hyphal forms in a biofilm community as demonstrated in the electron micrograph on the upper right panel of the slide. Experimental models of fungal biofilm formation demonstrate that the yeast-like cells adhere to these surfaces due to the expression of various adherence proteins on their cell surface. The cells transition to more filamentous forms that invade surrounding tissue and give stability to the growing biofilm. As the biofilm develops, the microbial cells are surrounded by a complex mixture of extracellular matrix comprised of both, both, both host and fungal components. Now, Why is this important? Because of this complex structure, biofilms are quite resistant to host immune attack as well as antifungal drug penetration, and this provides a protected site for fungal growth. Now, in addition to biological surfaces, fungal biofilms can also attach to prosthetic material such as the inner surface of IV catheters, prosthetic joints, or, or dentures. For catheters, the presence of a fungal biofilm makes it almost impossible to sterilize these devices once they become infected, and this often requires IV catheter removal for cure. This is graphically demonstrated in the adherent fungal biofilm demonstrated on the inner lumen of an IV catheter seen in the lower right image. Now, as can be seen in, in this image, the various morphological forms of candida species exist together and may also help to promote their pathogenesis. The more filamentous hyphal forms demonstrated in brown are better able to lyse and penetrate mammalian tissue, and the rounder yeast-like forms 
are likely better able to disperse and spread through the bloodstream to different tissues in the body. So from this view of candida biology, let's turn our attention to clinical disease. Now, since candida species most often exist on mucosal surfaces, it is at these sites where candida infection most commonly begins. Which patients are therefore at risk for developing mucosal candida infections, as opposed to being merely colonized by these fungi? In the image demonstrated here, we can see a simple case of localized thrush, or oral candidiasis. It presents as white plaques on the oral mucosal surface. Now, this type of infection can be seen in normal individuals and is most commonly encountered in the following conditions. First, this infection is very common in young infants whose immune systems are maturing and not yet primed to control the growth of candida species. Most babies develop thrush at some point during early immune development. Now, some clinicians see this as a normal wake-up call for the developing immune system to begin to recognize this microorganism with which it will interact for the rest of the person's life. Simple cases of mucosal candidiasis can also be seen when the overall microbial content of the mucosal surface changes, such as the oral thrush that occurs after patients use antibiotics for various infections. Vaginal candidiasis can also occur when the local microbiota changes in response to antibiotic use or due to the hormone changes encountered during the menstrual cycle or with menopause. These are examples of uncomplicated mucosal candidiasis that can occur in immunologically normal patients. However, severe forms of skin and mucosal candidiasis can be seen in patients who have suppressed immune systems. More extensive thrush and esophageal candidiasis can complicate disorders such as HIV infection, both during the initial acquisition of infection and especially during late stage AIDS. Also, as seen in the very disfiguring hand lesions on, on the slide, certain patients can develop severe forms of chronic and recurrent candida infections. Now, this condition is referred to as chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, and it is associated with a number of genetic defects in Th1 medi mediated immunity. As mentioned above, candidiasis most commonly presents with painful and invasive mucosal lesions, often associated with white fungal plaques. This is demonstrated in the case of oral thrush in an infant in the top panel, as well as in the esophageal lesions of an AIDS patient seen in the bottom right image taken with an endoscope. Similarly painful and irritated lesions with white discharge can be observed in vaginal candidiasis. Now, candidiasis of the skin most often occurs in moist regions such as the diaper area shown in the bottom left panel or under skin folds. Note the presence of the red singular satellite lesions around the more coalescing lesions in the center. This is a very typical clinical presentation of candida associated skin infections such as this case of diaper rash in a child. Now it's important to note two things about mucosal candidiasis. First, not all cases of thrush have white plaques. Sometimes mucosal candidiasis can present in an erythematous form with just mucosal irritation and very little white exudate. Now this can be very difficult to distinguish from other forms of mucosal irritation syndromes. Conversely, not all white filmy plaques on oral or vaginal mucosa are due to candida. For example, I have had many patients with gastroesophageal reflux who develop a white filmy material in their mouth. Now, although somewhat disturbing, this condition is often non-invasive, and the white film can be easily removed, revealing normal underlying oral mucosa. Indwelling dental devices like dentures can also cause an oral film that similarly does not invade or harm underlying oral tissue. Now, Similarly, not all vaginal discharges and irritation syndromes are caused by candidiasis. Uh, many things such as soaps and fragrances can result in irritant vaginitis, and atrophic vaginal changes due to menopause can also result in vaginal irritation. Also, various other vaginal conditions such as bacterial vaginosis or the sexually transmitted diseases, disease uh, trichomoniasis must be distinguished from vaginal candidiasis by physical examination. Now, despite the varied possibilities in the differential diagnosis, 
The confirmation of mucosal candidiasis is usually based on its characteristic clinical appearance. If there's any question about the diagnosis, one can scrape the involved surface or film and examine the sample by direct microscopy using potassium hydroxide or KOH to dissolve the host cells. This treatment will reveal the round yeast-like cells in the filamentous forms characteristic of many candida species. Rarely, culture of these anatomic sites can be used to help make the definitive diagnosis. Now, culture is most helpful for recurrent symptoms or for documenting the presence of a drug-resistant candida isolate. In rare cases, especially in patients with altered immune systems, mucosal biopsies will help to make the definitive diagnosis of mucosal candidiasis. It's important to remember that candid albicans is a normal part of the GI mucosal microbiota and the respiratory tract. Therefore, it can grow in many cultures, and this does not necessarily indicate that it's the cause of disease. This is especially important to remember during the interpretation of sputum samples, or stool cultures, in which the isolation of candida species may indicate its presence as normal flora, rather than as a pathogen. Candida albicans, the most common cause of mucosal candidiasis, is typically susceptible to many different antifungals. When possible, mucosal candidiasis should be treated by topical agents. However, one of the first questions that one must ask is whether or not to treat certain episodes of mucosal candidiasis. For example, an infant's oral thrush will often resolve on its own, and some may argue for no treatment. In fact, before the ability of less toxic and topical antifungal agents, most babies have thrush, and this condition resolved within days or weeks of its onset. However, this condition can be concerning for both the child and the parents. Now, it should not prop con prompt concerns for systemic d dissemination in otherwise immunologically normal babies, but it can cause a lot of discomfort, resulting in irritated babies and irritated parents. Additionally, Oral thrush in a nursing infant can potentially result in associated infections in the mother's breast and can discourage breastfeeding. Therefore, topical antifungals are frequently used to treat oral thrush in infants, such as topical nystatin and topical azoles. Similarly, in older patients, post-antibiotic oral thrush can also be treated with similar topical antifungals. Nystatin suspensions and topical azoles such as clotrimazole tablets are frequently used in this condition. Simple and uncomplicated vaginal yeast infections are also most commonly treated with topical azole creams. However, single-dose oral fluconazole is also an effective treatment for many patients. Skin infections such as candida-associated diaper rashes can also be treated with similar agents. In immunocompromised patients, the treatment of candidiasis can be a bit more complicated. Thrush is a common presenting symptom during the initial acquisition of HIV infection as well as in patients with late-stage AIDS. Treatment of the underlying immune dysfunction with antiretroviral therapy will result in lasting prevention of candidiasis as the immune system recovers. However, topical antifungals such as nystatin or clotrimazole oral tablets are often required to treat mucosal infections. Now, more extensive and deeper mucosal infections, such as esophageal candidiasis in Im immunocompromised patients, typically require systemic antifungals, such as oral fluconazole. Intravenous antifungal agents, such as the echinocandins or amphotericin B, can also be used to treat very severe forms of this disease. Chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis and the resulting severe mucosal and skin lesions are often also treated with systemic antifungals. Oral suppression with fluconazole has been used success, successfully to prevent recurrent infections. One particularly difficult condition is recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. A small subset of patients can develop recurrent vaginal yeast infections despite initially curative therapy. Now, these patients should be counseled about compliance with their topical and systemic therapies but sometimes prolonged and intermittent pulse-dosed regimens are required. Also, hormone-based therapy can be used to mitigate the associated changes in the vaginal microbiota associated with menopause, 
or the normal menstrual cycle. Now, this still can be a very clinically vexing problem. So in conclusion, we've discussed the candida species that can result in infections involving many mucosal surfaces, as well as the skin. These conditions are very commonly seen in routine medical practice, although often occurring in immunologically normal patients. Recurrent and more severe manifestations of these infections should alert clinicians to the possibility of underlying immunodeficiency syndromes.